This is my cottage garden, or at least that's what it's supposed to be. Currently, it's full of bindweed, and it's really getting out of hand and started flowering, which means I need to get back on top of it so it doesn't set seed. You would think that everything about an aggressive weed like bindweed would be bad, and it certainly has bad qualities, which you can see here. So this morning, I cleared the section to the left around the pear tree, and this afternoon, I want to get the rest of it cleared out too, because this is now a damage control situation. Bindweed grows really fast, winding itself around other plants to climb up and cover them with an attempt to strangle and smother them. In my case, it's even grown under this pavement, and it's now bursting up through it. Eventually, it will ruin this pavement by breaking it up if I'm not able to control it. What makes it so difficult to control is a combination of things. Bindweed is somehow both stretchy and brittle, so when you pull it by hand, it tends to break off, usually without much of the roots. And these creeping rootstocks are actually rhizomes. So they grow and spread horizontally underground and send shoots up to the surface all along these horizontal runs. On top of that, they can easily regrow. Any piece of rhizome left in the ground can sprout, and I've seen it happen with some very small pieces. On top of that, bindweed is an herbaceous perennial, hardy down to zone three or four. So all the foliage and vines die back over the winter. But the network of rhizome roots sit and wait, holding on to all their gathered energy from the previous season. Once temperatures warm up, it starts regrowing above ground at an alarming rate in the spring. So all this adds up to a fast-growing, massive plant, which includes a huge network of roots with countless sprouts of foliage with the potential to set seed from its flowers, as well as propagate itself from broken roots if it's been dug up without care. So how is it doing in my yard? Well, it's pretty happy here, mostly because I have enough of it that it's hard to keep up. This area has been a challenge this year. I started in March when the space was still lawn. I sheet mulched with cardboard to smother the grass and then spread topsoil for the beds and wood chips for the paths. And it was looking really good for a while, but at that point, the bindweed was still dormant for the winter. I knew there was bindweed in the grass, but I didn't know how much. I also knew that the cardboard wasn't going to stop it. So after about six weeks, it started bursting up. The original plan was supposed to be spot weeding the bindweed by slightly digging where the shoots came up to eventually weaken it. But it didn't take long before I decided that was going to be a losing battle because there were way too many sprouts and I would effectively be spot weeding everywhere. So I changed my plan and it became dig it all up and let it sprout so I'd know what still needed to be dug. That way I could remove as much of the roots as possible to weaken the bindweed and I wouldn't miss any spots. I wasn't expecting to get it all out at once, but by removing all that plant mass from the roots, I was hoping I would make good progress in weakening it, which would make managing this area much easier. So that's what I'd been doing this spring, and I felt like I was making progress. But as spring continued, the bindweed seemed to be growing faster and faster, and I haven't been keeping up. I still want to dig all this bindweed to remove a bunch of the roots, but I'm just not moving as fast as the bindweed right now. Which brings us to today. As I mentioned before, it's now starting to flower, which means I have got to get it out of here before those flowers turn to seeds and make this even worse. So the quick solution is just pulling it by hand. I'm trying to pull it carefully so it doesn't break off at the surface. Instead, I want it to break as far down as possible, which is mostly working, but there's still spots that I'm pulling more of the broken roots if I can. This is obviously way faster than digging, but surprisingly, it still took me an hour and a half to roll up these bundles of bindweed. This situation seems pretty bleak, but it's actually not all bad, and there are a few good things that I noticed as I was removing the bindweed. One is that since the bindweed has formed such a thick layer, it's now doing a really good job of mulching this area to hold the moisture in. 
I was starting to worry that I haven't been watering these two young fruit trees enough because I didn't want to water the bindweed, but I could see there was plenty of moisture in the soil as I was pulling the bindweed. The next thing I noticed was how many bugs there were. This dense mat has actually created a habitat for all sorts of things. There were a number of ladybugs, loads of spiders and little ants, as well as soil creatures like worms and centipedes. These two byproducts really showed the benefits and reinforced the idea of covering the soil with a living mulch or cover crop to maintain a healthy soil ecosystem. A third benefit of all this bindweed is compost. It's certainly not the first thing most people think when they see this many vines, but it can definitely be composted. Bindweed can thrive in poor compacted soil, which I think is what's happened here. We tend to have very dry summers, the grass grows well in the wet springs, and by summer it stops raining and the grass goes dormant. But the bindweed has deep roots, like up to nine feet deep, maybe more, where it's able to reach more moisture and nutrients deeper in the soil, which it has now brought up to the surface in the form of vines and foliage. So if you shift your perspective, you can think of this as harvesting nutrients from deep below the soil surface to make into free compost for your garden. And you can compost bindweed. This must be well over 30 pounds of it here. There's two strategies I take with composting bindweed. There's the lazy way, where I let the vines dry out and die in the sun for a week or two before adding them to the compost. And then there's a compost management strategy where I cook it with hot composting. Either way, I leave my compost to sit long enough that I would see the bindweed regrowing in the compost before I spread it in my garden. So this is where I'm currently at with my bindweed journey. It's a lot of work and I don't think I'm anywhere near the finish line. There are other methods of controlling bindweed, including covering to exclude light, diligently picking the top sprouts, effectively manually excluding the light. Both of these are to prevent photosynthesis. There are chemical solutions to control it, as well as using boiling water. The trouble I have with most of these is that bindweed can have such an extensive reserve of energy in its large root system that these become long-term strategies, and I'm hoping that I'm able to jump forward a couple years by manually removing as much of the roots as I can. From there, I can carefully work it down to the bitter end.